Hello and welcome to another Tundra Connections webcast. I'm Elisa McCall with Polar Bears International and I'm here in Tundra Buggy One on the shores of Hudson Bay just outside of Churchill, Manitoba. And we are having a bit of a snowstorm today and last night was pretty wild out here on the Tundra. The winds are gusting up to 90 kilometers an hour. It's been a little bit crazy so we're very lucky that we get to see a polar bear right now. So there's a polar bear just sleeping right outside our buggy over here. He's kind of hunkering down which they tend to do when it's blowing like this. We'll keep an eye on the bear for our broadcast and also keep an eye out. Oh, there's another bear I just saw off the corner of my eye that way too. So there we go. We have polar bears around and that's what we're talking about today is polar bears. The title of this webcast is Survival of the Fattest and we're largely going to be focusing on the polar bear's diet and why it's important that they eat a lot of fat and get really fat. I'm joined by our special guest today, Dr. Evan Richardson, and thank you so much for being here, Evan. Could you tell the viewers a bit about yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Evan Richardson. I'm a polar bear research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada, and I've been fortunate enough to be involved in research programs here in Western Hudson Bay for over the last 20 years. And so I get the opportunity to get up close and learn more about these bears and their habitat and how they're responding to changes in sea ice and understand their ecology and the importance of uh, the Arctic food web to their existence. Yeah, so we're very lucky to have Evan here today. And please send us your questions uh, so we can answer them for you. Evan knows all about the Arctic food chain and what polar bears are eating. The best way to send us questions is in the chat window below where you're watching on polarbearsinternational.org on our Tundra Connections TV there. Pop them in the chat window. If you're watching somewhere else, feel free to also put in the chat window if you're on explore.org. You can use our social media, for example, at Polar Bears on Twitter, and you can also email questions at pbears.org, but it might take us longer to get back to you on those ones. So the best way to answer your question live today is in that chat window. And we do want to hear your questions. We're going to talk for about 30 minutes or so, give or take, depending on how many questions we get. Uh, and we yeah look forward to discussing more about polar bears. So let's kick it off with where do polar bears even live? Where are polar bears? Evan, where do polar bears live? Polar bears live uh, across the circumpolar Arctic, so all around the North Pole uh, in, in, Arctic, in Arctic marine habitats. So even though we're looking at a bear today that's uh, laying on the, on, on the land and in the willows here in Churchill, Manitoba, polar bears really make a living out on the Arctic sea ice, and that's where they gain access to their primary prey, which are ice breeding seals, ring seals, and, and bearded seals. And so. Um, that's kind of their general distribution. Canada is home to around two-thirds of the world's polar bears, so um, we're very fortunate to, to have a lot of polar bears here in Canada and, and here in western Hudson Bay. And polar bears are the biggest bear species of all eight different bears. They get the biggest of all. Evan, how big do polar bears get? Well, the, the really big adult males get to 2,000 pounds, which is absolutely huge. And uh, when they stand on their back legs, they can be over 10 feet tall. So, um, like you said, they're the world's largest land carnivore. And so um, they're just absolutely impressive animals. But um, to make, that, uh, make those big bodies work, they need lots of energy. So we're going to be talking about that some more today, I think. Definitely. Yeah, 2,000 pounds. Depending on how old you are, that might be almost your entire classroom full of kids. So, yeah, do the math on that. That is a big, big polar bear. So, as Evan said, they, they need to get as big as possible. It comes down to their diet. Their diet is what makes them so big. And their diet mostly consists of blubber. First of all, what's blubber? So blubber is primarily composed of, of fat or, or lipids, and it's, a, it's an energy-rich tissue when we compare it to things like protein, which is, you know, that's what our muscles are made out of, that's what a steak's made out of, whereas, you know, fat is, um, you know, it has almost twice the calories that protein has, and so polar bears really make a, a living off fat, and they have a real high digestive efficiency for fat. It's, it's over 90% digestive efficiency for them, so when they're eating fat, they're really able to take it on and put it on their body. And you know, we talk about people, if you, you have too much extra weight or if you're, you have lots of fat on your body, it's, it's not healthy for people, but for polar bears, fat is healthy. 
Yeah, the fatter the better, definitely. Yeah. And a cool thing about eating fat too is that it might help with water. There's not a lot of water to drink in the Arctic, it's all frozen, but fat helps with that. Exactly, yeah. And so one of the, you know, adaptations that polar bears have, you know, living in this environment where water's, you know, frozen most of the year, is that they actually are able to make their own body water. So when they metabolize fat within their bodies, metabolizing around 100 grams of fat gets them around 100 grams of water, whereas if they metabolize protein, which is not their preferred energy source, they only get about half the amount of water. And so, um, you know, living off fat, you know, um, eating these, you know, fat-rich prey helps polar bears, you know, um, not only just meet their energetic demands, but also eat their, meet their demands for water, which is obviously an important uh, feature for all animals. Absolutely. And so seals are their main prey. Uh, ringed and bearded seals are the two main Arctic seal species who pack a lot of blubber. First of all, what, what's the difference between a ringed seal and a bearded seal? So ringed seals and bearded seals are what we both call ice-dependent seal species. So like polar bears, they rely on the sea ice to meet their life history requirements. Um, but a bearded seal is around four to five times larger than a ring seal. Ring seals are around 150 to 200 pounds and about, you know, uh, a third to a half of their body weight can be fat. And so that's, that's, a, that's a lot of fat for a bear that catches a seal and that high energy is, is good for the bears because they do have a high digestive efficiency for it. But these bearded seals are much, much larger and um, typically um, mostly hunted by big adult males because those bearded seals are actually too big for adult female polar bears to hang on to. And um, there's been some research to suggest that they can actually have their teeth broken because the defense of the bearded seal is to spin as soon as uh, an adult female grabs them. And so sometimes that can result in broken teeth. But the big adult males are just able to handle those larger food packages and that's who mostly eats the, the bearded seals. Imagine trying to take a bite of your favorite food and it spins away and breaks your teeth. <laughs> that would be a major bummer. Yeah. Interesting. Now is blubber um, from seal, is, I guess I should say, are seals the only source of blubber available to polar bears? Um, not the only source. I mean, so um, polar bears are opportunistic and so there's, there's other marine mammals um, in the Arctic environment that have, have blubber like whales. So there's bowhead whales, there's beluga whales, there's narwhals, um, there's other seals like harp seals and um, harbor seals that also have blubber. And so really, you know, the whole Arctic food chain is kind of based on, on fat and kind of this high energy source because there is so much seasonality to the availability of food. A lot of species really kind of depend on fat to kind of put them through the lean times and um, get them to the next, you know, time when the, the opportunity to get more food happens. So. Yeah, fat's really important, but it, it, there are other species that bears consume that have fat as well. Absolutely. So I want to dig into that seasonality that you mentioned a little bit. So we've been talking about fat and polar bears need fat and they need sea ice to access the seals to get the fat. Um, but right now there's no sea ice and the bear is not eating clearly here. Our bear just stood up outside. He's yawning a little bit. Um, we'll take a look at him in a minute here. So. How is it that polar bears, they need so much fat and they eat so much fat, but then we have periods like right now where these bears clearly aren't eating on land. Kind of, Can you walk us through a little bit about this feeding and fasting cycle that polar bears go through? Absolutely. And so, um, you know, similar to other bear species, I mean, bears in, in southern areas like black bears and brown bears, when there isn't food around in the wintertime, when there's no berries or, you know, there's nothing for them to eat, they just, they hibernate, they go into dens. And so... Polar bears um, don't really have that luxury. They, they come off the ice when it melts in the summertime and they don't go into dens. They just kind of sit around and, and try and not to use their energy as best as possible. And so we have this annual cycle where uh, the sea ice will be reforming here probably in the next month or so. And the bears will be going back out on the sea ice to, to look for seals and to look for their next meal. And they'll spend the winter out on the ice catching seals. And then when the springtime comes, that's a really important time for bears because um, that's when ring seals actually start having their pups. And they have their pups in these little under, uh, under snow layers. And those pups are, are kind of naive and they're vulnerable. And the bears are really good at catching them. And the, the, the good thing for the bears is those pups have a really high fat content. So they have a, a lot of blubber on their bodies. 
and, um, and they make a, a great meal package for a polar bear. And like I mentioned before, the polar bears are really good at digesting, um, you know, fat from these seals and putting it onto their bodies. And so they actually put on a lot of weight between sort of April till, you know, mid, late June, early July when the ice melts again. And so that's a critical feeding period for them. That's when they put on most of their um, excess body reserves for the year. And then when the ice melts, um, the seals are swimming in the water. They're way harder for the bears to catch. So the bears swim ashore and then um, spend their summer on land into the late fall where we are right now in, in Churchill, Manitoba, where the bears are, are resting and just mostly trying to conserve their energy, waiting to go back out and, and get another meal out on the sea ice. Yeah, so as Evan mentioned, it, it's always important what the ice is doing in Hudson Bay, but all across the Arctic, of course. Right now, we're waiting for freeze-up, so these bears are waiting for the ice to come so they can get out there and hunt. Uh, but arguably more important is that breakup period. So when the bears are eating so well out on that sea ice in the spring, we always hope that there's a later breakup so that the bears get more time out on that ice before they come back to land um, in preparation for this long kind of fasting that they have here. Now. When they are on land, they will still eat other things. There's still a bear. What, what sort of things will bears eat, and then how does that compare to blubber for them? Yeah, I mean, so like we were talking about before, polar bears are really opportunistic, and they'll eat a lot of different things. Um, we've seen them eating lemmings here in, in Churchill on Tundra Buggy One. Um, you know, people around town have seen them hunt snow geese. Uh, we know they eat bird eggs sometimes. They'll walk around in eider colonies and eat eggs. Um, every once in a while they'll get lucky and catch a caribou. Um, but our research has shown that, you know, when bears eat these terrestrial food sources or these food sources that are either higher in protein or in case of berries, higher in carbohydrates, um, the bears don't have that really high digestive efficiency that they have uh, for fat. And so even though they can consume these, you know, uh, food resources on land, they don't get a lot of good energy out of them. And, you know, it just doesn't really match up with, um, you know, the amount of energy they get from these, you know, fat seals that live out on the sea ice that they're, you know, highly adapted to, to hunt and, um, and consume and digest. So it's, um, there, are other, there are other things to eat, but, you know, they just, they just don't um, match up with the polar bear's adaptations for, you know, life in the Arctic marine environment. And I have to imagine a hungry polar bear could put away a lot of eggs, and that's not so great for the birds either, <laughs> getting their eggs decimated. That's right, yeah. Some of our research programs have, have shown that um, polar bears, when they do come into these colonies, because there isn't a lot of energy in the eggs, they eat a lot of the eggs, and um, so that can have impacts on eider ducks that are, are not used to that type of predation. The bears are really good at swimming. So eiders often nest on islands to get away from things like Arctic foxes, but the bears easily swim out to these islands and, you know, uh, a 1,500 pound, 1,800 pound polar bear can, can eat a lot of eider eggs if it's bored and has nothing else to do. So, yeah. Yeah, not so great for the ducks. Imagine eating like a 100 egg omelet. That would be a bit much for us. But for a polar bear, that's just a Tuesday, I guess. And actually that leads me, so if a, if a polar bear has a seal, catches a seal or a couple seals, how much can they eat in one sitting? We get that question a lot because they can really gorge themselves when they have good food. Yeah, I mean, they're, um, you know, they have to make the best of every meal that they have the opportunity to take. And so they um, can eat, you know, over 100 pounds of blubber at a time. And so they have really large stomachs so they can take all that food in. And then one of the unique things about polar bears is between their stomachs and their large intestines, um, there's a really small opening. So they can eat a lot of food, but it doesn't get pushed through fast. And as I mentioned before, they have this um, high digestive efficiency because they're able to slow down how quickly that f food moves through their system. Because, um, you know, if they ate a whole bunch and, you know, it just moved through them really quickly, they wouldn't have the opportunity to, to break it all down, take it into their bodies and, you know, store that energy for future use. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that part. Very cool. Um, I want to talk for a minute about moms and cubs because we always like to talk about moms and cubs and staying fat and healthy is especially important for females who are pregnant and trying to successfully have a litter um, and the females right now that are on land so they've the females here they have come onto land about July they're entering their dens now and they're not going to come out again until maybe March so that's about eight months without eating so 
for a female, being fat to reproduce is a pretty big deal uh, to continue the polar bear population. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as you mentioned, they have, you know, this really long period where they're inside dens, um, they're, they're gestating, so their cubs are, are growing inside of them, then they give birth to their cubs in the dens, um, then they start lactating or producing milk to feed those cubs so they can grow. Because when the cubs are born, they're only like a pound or a pound and a half. They're like the size of a Labrador puppy. They have really short hair. Um, they're in these peat dens here in Churchill, Manitoba. And so, you know, the cubs are born in, in late December, early January, but the female has to feed them milk for the next two months. And so it's not just, you know, her laying around and resting. She's using up her body fat to make this, you know, fat-rich milk to help her cubs grow because she needs to get back out on the sea ice to, to get her next meal in the springtime and, you know, um, hit that really key feeding period that we've been talking about in the spring when these you know, young seal pups that aren't really smart about polar bears are, are out there to be caught. And so the females are really good at catching those little pups. So one reason that we know sea ice is so important to polar bears is that when we start seeing a decline in Arctic sea ice, we do start seeing changes in the polar bear population. Where we are right now, just outside of Churchill, Manitoba, uh, this area is home to the Western Hudson Bay polar bear subpopulation. That's one of 19 different subpopulations of polar bears across the world broken up into different groups. And this one is one of the most southern populations and it's also one of if not the best studied in the world so there's over 40 years of data Evan has contributed over 20 years of those data I'm sure I think uh, and we know from this area we know the sea ice is changing and we've seen changes in the polar bear population linked to those sea ice changes and Evan I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because ultimately it, it boils down to food and nutrition that these changes happen absolutely yeah for sure and um, you know one of the things that we've seen in the long term, not just here in western Hudson Bay, but in places like the Beaufort Sea in, in northern Alaska um, and Davis Strait on the east coast, is before we see any sort of changes in population size or survival or the number of cubs individuals are producing, the first thing we start to see change a little bit is the actual body condition of the bears. So we start to notice, you know, in several of these subpopulations that the bears were getting a little bit skinnier. They weren't quite as fat as they used to be because they're not getting that time on the sea ice. The ice is melting. They're coming ashore earlier. And as they got leaner and leaner, what we saw here in Churchill, Manitoba, is that um, survival started to come down a little bit. Females started to have slightly smaller litters, um, a little bit lower cub survival. The bears don't grow as big as they used to. And this is all related to the availability of food and the ability of the bears to put on as much body fat as they can during that spring feeding period. And so with climate change and global warming, we're seeing less time on the sea ice and more time on land. So that means less time feeding and more time fasting, living off their body reserves. And so one of the first things we do see is a change in just how fat the bears are. And that's a good signal for scientists and wildlife managers and conservationists that there may be some things coming down the road in terms of changes in the population size or the number of cubs that uh, females be having and um, you know obviously in the long term that's concerning and so you know we need to address climate change. Absolutely. Yeah, our mission is to keep polar bears roaming the Arctic, and we know that we can. We know that we can do that. The, these polar bears here, we can kind of call them our fat, white, hairy canaries in the coal mine. They're telling us that as the sea ice changes, so do the polar bears. But we know that we can act to keep polar bears around, and that is going to be by switching from fossil fuels using more renewable energies, energy from nature like solar and wind, and getting our world leaders on board to make these big changes to sustain a future for polar bears, but also for people. And at the end of this broadcast, we're going to play you a short video that explains that process and how we can empower anyone, and especially youth, uh, to help make changes for our future. But right now, we are going to take a few questions. We do have some from the audience. If you have questions still, you absolutely have time. Plunk them into that chat box for us, and we'll take a look. Uh, anything you want to know doesn't necessarily have to be about diet even. So uh, I'm going to throw you a few questions, Evan. Sounds good. Um, there's an interesting one from Stacy, and we get this question particularly in Hudson Bay. Do orca whales and polar bears ever engage? Like if they're both predating seals, what's that relationship like? 
Yeah, so to the, the best of our knowledge, um, you know, we don't think that polar bears and orcas engage. Um, so polar bears obviously want to be out on the sea ice and, and hunting for seals. And orcas, because they have that really large, tall dorsal fin, they typically don't show up into the Arctic until all of the sea ice melts. If you look at something like a beluga whale, which is an ice-adapted species, or a narwhal, which is an ice-adapted species, they don't have that dorsal fin. And one of the reasons for it is because they're constantly coming up and down in small leads and, and in the sea ice, and that, that fin would just get in the way. And so typically the ice melts, the bears swim ashore for the summertime, and then the orca whales show up in the Arctic. And similar to the polar bears, uh, the orcas are up here trying to get these high caloric food sources. They're hunting beluga whales, they're hunting narwhals, they're hunting seals. So rather than eating fish, they make the long trip to the Arctic because they know if they do, they can get these you know, high caloric, you know, blubber rich food resources that you know, can take them a long way in terms of you know, the energy they need throughout the year. Oh, great, thanks for that question, Stacy. Um, I oh, have another one for Stacy. This is a great one too. Is it typical for females to be pregnant annually or how often are they having cubs? What does that cycle look like? Uh, yeah, great question. So um, females typically have a, a three year reproductive cycle. So one of the important things about polar bear life history is that the cubs need to learn a lot of things from their moms. Um, as I mentioned, when they're born, they're really small, like the size of a Labrador puppy. When they leave their dens, they're, you know, 20 to 30 pounds. But they have to go out on the sea ice. They have to learn how to hunt seals from their mother. They'll watch her as she's hunting seals. They learn where to go to look for seals. So cubs will go back to places where, where their mom has taken them. And it, it takes some time for them to learn all of these things. And so, and to grow big enough to be able to catch seals on their own. Obviously a small cub can't jump on a you know, 150, 200 pound seal and, and, and catch it. And so they need to get big enough to catch these large prey resources as well. So at the end of their, um, coming into their second year and their third year, so when they're like two years and three or four months old, that's when they'll be back out on, they'll be on the sea ice with their mom and she'll kind of shoo them away and she'll actually come, come back into estrus. She'll be available to mate with males on the sea ice. And that's when she says goodbye to her cubs. She'll mate again, and then she'll go back into a, a den later again that uh, late summer, early fall. Yeah, so that spring, she needs a lot of fat, particularly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, gets super fat. Thank you again for that question. And th this is another reason we need to keep sea ice as stable as we can, because when moms are teaching their little cubs what the sea ice patterns look like and how to hunt, you can imagine if the sea ice is changing in just a few years and you're that little cub now growing up, maybe what your mom taught you doesn't apply anymore. So uh, we want to keep the ice stable for all these polar bears. Few more questions. Well, here let's stay in the cub vein for a moment. What is the maximum number of polar bear cubs that a mom can have at one time? Um, so typically, females have two cubs. That's like the average, so twins. Um, but here in Churchill, Manitoba, um, frequently through the 1980s and early 1990s, we saw quite a few triplet litters. So um, three cubs at a time is not uncommon. Um, back during that time when females had more energy, they were having larger litters. And so, the, you know, that was around 20 to 25 percent of the, the litters here in Hudson Bay were, were triplets. We really don't see that very much anymore because females just don't have the energy to have that many cubs. Um, there was one case where um, a research team caught a female that had four cubs. And so that's, that's the largest litter we know of. Um, but one unique thing we found in our long-term monitoring programs through genetic analysis is that females will actually adopt cubs. So from genetics and their, their DNA, we can actually determine whether a cub that we see with the female is actually her own, similar to you know, any sort of um, DNA analysis that you might see in crime shows. You can identify individual bears and you can tell you know, who they're related to. And so, um, but yeah, to get back to the kind of the question is, um, there's a place called Hoot Creek way down in uh, south of Churchill here in Wapasa National Park and the Hoot Creek quads were <laughs> famous within the research program for the only time anybody's ever caught a female with, with four uh, dependent offspring. Yeah, 
pretty neat stuff. Not yeah. something we see every day. Yeah. We are hoping that we'll see moms and cubs kind of walk through here in the coming weeks. We often do. Um, so we'll keep an eye out. It's always a really fun thing to see. We're going to take a few more questions. You still have a minute to send them in if you'd like, and then we'll start to wrap up here. Um, what do the seals eat to get so fat? That's a great question. How does that start? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean, polar bears are at the top of the food chain in the Arctic marine environment. They're, they're one of the top predators, um, similar to killer whales. And so, you know, through that whole Arctic food web from um, tiny little um, diatoms and copepods, the fat kind of accumulates as you go up the food chain. So you go from tiny little things that are swimming around underneath the sea ice and eating algae off the bottom of the ice to, you know, small shrimps and euphosids, just, you know, kind of creepy crawly things that live in the Arctic marine environment. And then fish are feeding on those. Uh, things like capelin and, and sand lance are preferred prey for um, ring seals in particular. Bearded seals actually eat a lot of stuff off the ocean floor, like um, crabs and uh, mussels and clams. So they're like a benthic feeder. But um, all through that, that food web, fat's kind of accumulating as you kind of go up in size in these different animals. And um, so the seals eat a lot of um, fish that has a lot of, a lot of fat in them. And um, they are in turn take that fat on to their bodies. And if a polar bear catches a seal, they get that uh, fat as well. Yeah, and that, that really highlights the importance of thinking about the whole ecosystem altogether. You know, we're not just about polar bears. Uh, one of the reasons we love talking about polar bears and working to protect polar bears is that they are at the top of the food chain and act as this sort of umbrella species, meaning things we do to protect polar bears can protect all of the creatures underneath them. It all in the Arctic comes down to Arctic sea ice and that chain, especially that lipid chain uh, that runs throughout the entire kind of food web with polar bears at the top. And we can't forget the people too. People live across the Arctic and also rely on these same foods um, and on calories. You can imagine it's not so easy to have a vegetable garden up here. Uh, so people find what they can um, and it's a pretty cool but hard place to live. So another reason we love celebrating the polar bears. And we see our bear outside, he's just stretching, doing another big yawn, readjusting in this winter storm we're having. So. Nice to see some snow on the ground anyway. Um, are there instances that polar bears band together as adults? Like would they hunt together out on the ice or are they solitary? What does that look like? Yeah, so I mean in general, they're, they're a solitary species out on the sea ice. I mean obviously, you know, females spend a lot of time with their, their cubs. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, observations of bears like working together to, to hunt for, for prey, but quite often if they have a large prey source, um, they'll share it with another bear. So just to avoid conflict and having a fight and somebody getting hurt, if there's a, a big bearded seal, quite often you'll have multiple bears feeding on it. And then every once in a while you'll get something big like a, a bowhead whale that, that dies and washes up on shore and you can have... 20, 30, 40 polar bears all on a, on a big whale carcass and they didn't necessarily work together to, to catch the whale but they're fine being shoulder to shoulder and you know um, uh, chowing down on these whale carcasses you know and just kind of making the best of a situation and they don't you know they don't really like to get into conflict because they are su such large animals and if you know they really do start fighting then you know there's a chance that somebody's going to get hurt so that's right. never a good thing you got to be healthy out here to to make a living as a polar bear and so they generally avoid conflict and polar bears interestingly they're not territorial you can imagine their habitat is always moving anyway beneath their feet they're not defending territories like say a grizzly bear or a brown bear would same species different area so i think polar bears share a lot more nicely than the brown bear does generally speaking yeah, yeah. for sure <laughs> yeah um and then when the when bears are interacting with each other are they vocalizing? Like, is that a way that bears communicate or how do they, they talk to each other or decide to share things like that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, polar bears do vocalize. They can kind of growl and, and, and roar. Uh, one of the things they also do is called mouth gaping. So they'll just kind of yawn and open their mouth and kind of show their teeth to another bear. Um, there's a lot of kind of subtle cues in terms of how they posture their body because they can't have a conversation like you and I. I mean, they have mm -hmm. some vocalizations that they do, but 
just kind of their their behavior, the way they hold their head, like if they're, you know, kind of up and proud or kind of down and submissive, if their ears are back, that's more of an aggressive kind of posture. Mm -hmm. And so they, they have their little, uh, it's almost like sign language, right, to kind of tell each other that, you know, if they're happy or not, or, you know, just kind of stay out of my space sort of thing. Yeah, they have their own bare language. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take just a couple more questions from Facebook, and then we're going to wrap up here. Um, how do polar bears swim? And that's from um, Kalia. I hope I'm saying your name right. She's seven years old. How do they swim? Yeah, great question. So polar bears are, are great swimmers. They can swim for days at a time. Uh, one of the nice things about being sort of, you know, these chubby bears is they do they do float well in, <laughs> in water. So, you know, being fat helps with that and also helps keep them warm. But they kind of just, you know, they dog paddle with their, their, their front, front uh, forepaws and just kind of pull themselves through the water. They kind of steer with their back legs. They don't really kick with their back legs. Their back legs kind of act like a rudder um, to kind of steer them as they're moving along. But most of their swimming and propulsion comes from just kind of moving those front legs and kind of a dog paddle motion to, to pull themselves through the water. Yeah, great question. They are great swimmers. It takes a, a lot of energy to swim, though. Yeah. Yeah, they need to eat a lot of seals to make up for swimming. Um, okay, our, this is from Amy. Are polar bears endangered at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's classical definitions on, you know, endangered and threatened species. But, you know, in, in general, you know, their habitat is, um, you know, endangered. You know, we are losing sea ice. There's lots of data to show that global warming is contributing to that. In places here in Western Hudson Bay, you know, the population has declined substantially. Um, you know, the bears are threatened by climate change. Um, you know, so polar bear existence, you know, is dependent on the on the sea ice. And, you know, different countries have different classifications for, you know, kind of the status of, of polar bears. But, you know, in the long term, their, their habitat's being threatened. And, you know, ultimately, the species will be, be endangered if we don't do anything about climate change. Which brings us to our last question from Isha. What is being done to ensure they don't go extinct? Uh, I'll throw it to you on the research side, and then I'll talk a bit about the social side, maybe. Yeah, that's a, a, a great question. And, you know, one of the things that um, our research program does is, is provide data to show the impacts of, of climate change. So, you know, being able to demonstrate these changes in body condition, the bears are skinnier, you know, we measure them, we weigh them, we can show that they're smaller, we can show that they're, you know, having smaller litters, we can show that survival is lower and, you know, bad sea ice years. We can, we can demonstrate all this with, you know, empirical data, and, you know, that's been collected over decades and decades. And so, um, you know, that really helps kind of feed into what we call policy and management. So, you know, people ask, well, why should we, care about climate change you know like winters are cold in Canada maybe it'd be nice if it's a little warmer but you know ultimately you know the impacts are, are felt here in places like western Hudson Bay and so you know various nations are, are working together to address, address climate change you know not just for polar bears but you know for a variety of other reasons that are important for the planet um, but you know polar bears obviously provide us a signal that things are changing, that, you know, species are being impacted and that we need to do something about global warming. Absolutely. And the good news is that things are being done around the world. Uh, one thing that's coming up next week is that uh, the COP27 is happening in Egypt, and that's a meeting of world leaders coming together to discuss next steps for climate action to protect our planet. We will have representatives there, and we will be doing um, a webcast on November 8th with cop directly so look forward to that and also in the meantime there are things happening all around us that are good news um, and there's leaders making changes and it's important for us no matter how old we are uh, to be supporting those changes because it's not only about the polar bears it's our people it's our planet um, as youth a few things you can do is simply talk about it talk about polar bears or things that you enjoy outdoors with your friends and family, things that are important to you. Just changing social conversations has a huge impact on changing social situations. Another thing you can do no matter your age is look up uh, who represents you 
on either your it could be your city council, it could be your state or your province, or it could even be your country, and consider writing an email or even leaving a voicemail and talking to someone, thanking them for something they did for climate action or asking them to do more for their climate, and that's a great school activity. Uh, right at the end here, we're going to have a, a lovely little video to show you talking a bit more about polar bears and actions you can take, and we also have a ton of great resources online. I'm just going to do a quick wrap up to thank everyone, and then we'll play that video. So first of all, thank you, Evan, for being here today. Great guests. We're lucky to have you. Thanks for being on Buggy One. Thanks to KT, my colleague behind the scenes running the show here today. You can't see her, but she's doing all the mixing. Thank you to explore.org with all the polar bear cams. Please check out these polar bear cams this fall. We'll be streaming them uh, for the next few weeks. We also have beluga cams in the summer, northern lights cam in the winter. These explore.org cams are so much fun and such a cool way to see parts of the world uh, that we otherwise might not be able to visit. If you've enjoyed learning today, uh, ask an adult, get online, check out our other Tundra Connections webcasts. If you're a teacher or a parent, again, we have great resources online, uh, both on our website and on sites like Flip, Microsoft Flip. We've got a lot of great lessons and fun activities there. Um, and also, if you like Lego, we are, uh, we've created a Lego Buggy One model, and we're asking for votes to get it made into a, a true Lego kit. So it's just a fun way to further different conversations about polar bears and, and climate change. So check out our Lego Buggy one. We'll make sure there's a link around for you there. Um, otherwise, just continue to follow your curiosity and ask questions and stay involved. And thank you so much for watching us today, learning all about why it's important to be fat in the Arctic, especially if you're a polar bear. Survival of the Fattest was our webcast today. Thanks again, and we'll play this video for you now. Hope to see you soon. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. A polar bear's life cycle is almost exclusively tied to the sea ice. Because polar bears rely on sea ice to hunt, to breed, and sometimes to den, sea ice loss from climate change is their biggest threat, and the reason the bears are listed as vulnerable on the IUCN's red list of threatened species. What we learn about climate change impacts on polar bears in Hudson Bay can be applied across the Arctic to help conserve other populations. Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see, regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth, trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. When Arctic waters are cold enough, the top layer freezes into a special type of ice called sea ice. Sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest. It supports the entire Arctic food chain. Food from this marine ecosystem also sustains northern communities. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for gen- Hi, welcome to the last polar bear live chat of the polar bear season. We're so happy you could join us today. 